There we go. That's what we wanted to hear. <clears throat> and so if everyone is, hang on, there's another one dropping in. Excuse me. All right, so um, I'll uh, start the official thing now. So good evening, everybody. Welcome again to another whiskey tasting here through the Whiskey Company on a Thursday night. We hope wherever you are that it's uh, warmer than it was for the last one of these because I remember I was absolutely shivering here. We've just been talking about how, you know, uh, for us spring and uh, summer is on the way and uh, for Paul Stewart, who you're about to meet, it's uh, just saying it's final goodbye. So, uh, you know, the uh, joys of um, different climate zones and all that fun stuff. So, of course, we're here for Bel Blair tonight. I'm um, looking forward to this. It's going to be great. We've got four <coughs> great whiskeys, um, all age statements. So it uh, should be a nice journey through them all. And um, I'm going to introduce you to Stuart Baxter, who is uh, the Global Ambassador for Bel Blair. Um, well, I admit Phyllis, get in here. Um, and I'm let him introduce you and uh, we'll start our uh, presentation there. So Stuart, how are you? Very, very well, Anton. Thanks very much for having me. No problem at all. Yeah. Cam, I'm, I'm convinced that that's a background, but just to confirm that is not a bar you're sitting in, right? Right, because Rob's is definitely a background. I can tell that. <laughs> and. Sinclair, I was going to ask at the beginning, is that a small TV at the back left there? No, that's a uh, Lego model of a uh, old TV with a classic Nintendo. I was going to say Super Mario. Mario. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you can see the, <laughs> even the color scape. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, so, no, thanks very much for being It's been great here. It is 10 in the morning, so I think I, I said I've been drinking since 7. That's not... Mm, uh, <laughs> But 10 in the morning here, and I'm going to have a little nip of all of these, considering we've got a pretty decent lineup. Um, but to fully introduce myself, so my name is Stuart Baxter. So I cover our full sports portfolio for international beverage. Uh, my background is so I used to, my first kind of scope in the whiskey industry was with Pernod Ricard. So I was in India as their single malt specialist for two years. Then I went to Douglas Lane. Uh, so if anyone knows Douglas Lane, small independent bottler and do blended malts as well but we when i left them it was a company of like 24 people so that's where i learned cask aging blending cask selection bottle purchasing label design and um, all as their global ambassador it was a kind of all hands on deck kind of focus um which was great and then from there and um, started with international beverage two years what's the day today two years yesterday and i didn't even celebrate uh, yesterday was my two-year anniversary with International Beverage. So covering our full spirits portfolio, we've got Thai Rums, Val Blair, Old Pulteney, Speyburn, Anok, uh, Karun Gin is also ours. So yeah, it's uh, it's an absolute cracking lineup and keeps me definitely on my toes. So throughout this, as I said, the chat's going. So any questions, please just throw them in. We've got a presentation, which I always think sounds horrible because it just gives you PTSD to Monday morning when you're just sitting there staring at a screen. But it is a video presentation. I don't normally do them. I like to do these kind of just by chat, but with the Bal Blair one that we've got, it shows you images of the mash tons, shows you images of the distillery, and it kind of gives you that tangible feel of what I'm really trying to describe throughout this. Um, but as Anton said, please keep the chats going because if I'm monologuing for an hour, hour and a half, however long this is gonna be, it's gonna be hell for you. And it's, it's not gonna be enjoyable for anyone, right? So we'll get into it. Um, but I'll throw my screen up. So I can see, so Anton, I can see everybody, but I can't see the chat. So just if anything comes through, just um, interrupt me, stop me. And we'll get yeah, into not it. a problem at all. Um, so through, yeah, even to actually, can I see the chat one second? I think I can. I can. Um, has the screen stops run for you guys? Has it stopped running for me? Yeah, stop running. Is that it running now? Perfect. Uh, so I can't see the chat, but has everyone, has anyone had Bal Blair before? Even just nods, I think I can see most people in this. So a few people, yes, a few people, no, it's grand. So to kind of give you a landscape of where we're actually located is just here. So we are in the Highlands and a lot of people in Bal Blair and Edgerton, and I'll show you exactly where we are in a small map. They'll tell you that this is the true Highlands. So Glen Goyne, as a lot of you will know, I grew up next to that. But Glen Goyne is the first Highland distillery, the foot of the Campsies. You know, the distilleries in the Highlands and the warehousing or the, the, the warehousing they have on site is in the Lowlands. But Bal Blair and Edgerton and then Dornach, they will they'll tell you to absolutely do one. 
that actually this is the start of the Highlands. And that's the distillery scape that you can see here, surrounded by the Struy Hills and the Dornoch Firth. But again, we'll zoom in and have a quick look at the map on that. Um, the one thing I like to say is that if anyone's seen the, what's the whiskey movie? Um, the, the Angel Share. I don't know if anyone's seen that whiskey movie. No. If you have, if you haven't seen it, go watch it. It is one of the most comical movies I think I've ever seen. But it's about a whiskey journey up to find the holy glare of whiskey, and it's actually all filmed at Balblair. And actually, a lot of the production guys are in the movie, apart from John McDonald, our distillery manager. Ken Loach said he looked too young to be a distillery manager, which was absolute nonsense. Uh, he's John McDonald, six foot five, long flowing hair. It looks like a well-groomed horse after COVID. If they're growing that hair out, so Balblair. Established 1790. So it makes us one of the oldest distilleries in Scotland um, in terms of establishment. There's a timeline that will show you we did move the site once, um, but established and the license came through in 1790. And it was the same license that we've retained to today. Um, 1790 makes us, I believe, the fourth oldest distillery in Scotland. Glen Turret recently found documentation proving they're the oldest. But I don't know if they jumped from behind us in front, pushing us back or if pushed them from say third to first. So don't quote me on, on exactly where we are because that has either changed or not. But I think we're the fourth oldest distillery or licensed distillery in Scotland, which is surprising because most of these distilleries you see in Glasgow and Edinburgh, just from transport links. So to be that far north in a 1790 as opposed to an 1824, 1825 is quite, is quite rare. But to kind of show you where exactly we're located on the world map, I always find this is excessive because we're such a, Everyone knows that that's, that's, the, that's the world, that's Earth, this is Scotland. But we're located about halfway up the neck. So from Inverness, we're about a 45 minute drive north from there. Small distillery right in the Dornoch Firth. And if anyone's been up that way for golfing or whatever, um, it is quite a secluded part of the world. Does anyone know a small distillery called Glenmorangie? No? Tiny, I know, right? Insignificant. Uh, but Glen Morangy, if anyone's driven past, is on your right-hand side as you're coming up the roads. You'll come to a roundabout and you take a right over the bridge. Instead of taking a right, if you go straight for about three miles, that's where we're located, just in there. Um, John McDonald, our Huntmaster Distiller, actually, he was 10 years at Glen Morangy before coming to us. He's been with us for 19 years, but his brother is finishing up. It's 41 years this year at Glen Morangy. Uh, so he's been a production manager, uh, not distillery manager, as Bill Lumsden's obviously retained that title. Um, but he has been a production guy for 41 years at Glen Morangy. Um, so the family of John and the team are very much uh, indoctrinated um, at the site. Great thing about this is that I'm starting with the 12, but what I'm going to say before I forget, because everyone ends up necking it, is that we're going to taste the 12 just now, because I'm not going to talk for 25 minutes before you get your first whiskey. But I want you to keep a little bit of the 12 in the glass just to compare it, especially to the 15 year old. But another thing is, is that when we come back to this, the amount of people that think that the 12 year old or even the first whiskey in a lineup is the weakest, it's probably the least intense, hence why it goes first. Because I like to do whiskey tastings primarily based on flavor. It doesn't always go chronologically. But I think with Balblair, we can do it. There can be an argument made for the 18 to come before the 15. But the, the reason I like to do it this way is specifically comparing it to the 15. So do keep a little bit of the 12 in your glass um, before we move on. And before the tasting, I actually threw in the 15 and the 18 randomly at one point in the slides. So they could pop up at any time, um, which I think keeps it a little bit fresh. And it's not kind of just scripted in that way. So as everyone poured their first dram, cracking. Thanks, Leo, for the thumbs up, because I can see I can see you, Malt Maniacs, Cam, and Rob. <laughs> so have a nose of this, have a taste of it. It's your whiskey. You're all you're all adults, you know exactly what you're doing with this now. Have a nose of taste. I'm just going to talk to the concept of, of the age statements, because I know a lot of you will be missing the the advantages, and I'm going to talk to that a little bit. Um and and the, the kind of victory that we had when we established these back in 2019. Um, the 12 year old is natural color. There's no added color to any bulb layer from uh, even the vintages. There's no added coloring um, to all of our single casts, anything. Um, it's 46%. Everything again that we're tasting tonight is going to be 46%, and everything is non chill filtered. So all the fatty acids and proteins are still in the whiskey, and that's everything. And the big win that we had, and I've been privy to the conversations that were had, was. 46% natural color, non-chill filtered for a 12-year-old that is all bourbon cask. 
is rarer and rarer these days. Um, what I mean to say is that normally you'll contain caramel coloring, you'll bring it down to 40, 43% because it's more appeasing to your, your average or the majority of whiskey consumers. I'm not talking about whiskey geeks like ourselves. I'm talking about your average whiskey consumer who goes in and, right, 40% is a lot. I know it doesn't sound like it does. You know, we're looking for cash strength, 46 is a kind of bare minimum for that flavor profile and alcohol to carry it through. But 40% is still a lot. 40% of that liquid in that bottle is pure alcohol, right? So a lot of people come into whiskey and they still think that's quite a bit. But the real thing was that because we won this fight at 46% non-chill filtered, no caramel is the entry level malt. It means that anything it sets a benchmark, anything beyond this will still be 46% minimum, unless it falls below that naturally and uh, non-chill filtered and it will contain no caramel coloring. So it was a very important win. Um, and I was, I was told there was many verbal arguments. And I think that's me being modest considering it's a recording, um, but many arguments and discussions about making sure that this was a benchmark set. And the reason being is that Bal Blair, we're a small distillery, but what we're trying to position this as is it's it's rustic raw, but it's also not necessarily for the majority of whiskey drinkers, that it is for a much more discerning drinker, if that makes sense. I know that sounds a bit of marketing speak, but it really was the objective you know, from the back end. And you'll see throughout this, and it is recorded, so I'm going to be a bit careful, but sales and marketing don't exactly enjoy my tastings because anything that you guys ask, I'll give you an honest answer. I like to give it as transparent as possible because the whole idea of, you know, we don't talk about single malt being blended, right? I think that whole concept is much more romantic and it adds much more complexity and and kind of passion behind it than just saying, oh, it's, you know, it's married casks and, you know, ignoring it. I think actually going into it is, is much better. So yeah, Leo, no caramel coloring. But the big thing with that is that we'll go into the 15 is actually we'll see the difference between it, but I'm not going to ruin the surprise just yet. So nose, um, I think someone said stewed pears. I, I can see that immediately. I think there's lots of orchard fruit in this. Soft touch of oak, but there's that real fruity tropical note in behind it. And we'll go into how we make the new make, but I've got some here unmarked. This is our 69% new make, which is also our filling strength. So 69% is also the cask filling strength. We don't bring it down to 64. Um, Spayburn is the only distillery in our portfolio that we bring down to 64 to fill into cask. But 69%, the tropical notes that we get from this all come from our esterification, which we'll go into talk about the production side of things. But it gives you that real bed of almost like pineapples and mangoes. And anything I say is not gospel, right? Everyone's got different experiences and different olfactory paths in their brain. So it's just my expression. I'm not right. I'm not wrong. It's just my opinion. There's also a dryness to it for me. There's like a kind of, not specifically looking at barley, but almost like a dried grass or not necessarily dried fruit, but like a, a herbal note in behind it in the nose. And about what time are we on now? 10 plus after 10 hour. Cheers, slanch. I've only got the rest of my working day after this. It's fine. I'm a little more creative in the presentations. <laughs> but to talk to the color on this, a lot of people do tell me in tastings how light in color it actually is, which is, but I think, you know, having worked with Douglas Lane and doing cast selection at all natural color, the color in that's actually pretty impressive for the casks that we put this into. Um, and we'll go into more detail in casts in a bit, but the casks that is the foundation of every single one of the whiskeys you're going to taste tonight is two different ex-bourbon casks. We're actually looking at refill bourbon and we're looking at refill hog, well, all root cat hogs has a refill, but looking at about third to fourth fill hogsheads, um, all light to medium char. So when we go to the sherry casks, all first fill for the 15, 18 and 25, sorry to answer Rob's question, 15, 18, 25 would probably go closer to mid char. Um, as much as it's first fill Oloroso and the predominant color is obviously coming from there. It just gives us a deeper section into the woods, but for the uh, all the bourbon, that's the foundation, that's all probably light to medium char. Um, and I think that's probably quite transparent in the color that comes through from it. It's still refill hogsheads, refill bourbon barrels to 12 years minimum in the cask. And the reason that we did this was everyone always asks, first of all, you know, why is it such a light color? Why didn't you go darker? Because obviously we didn't add caramel coloring, right? That's one thing. But the other thing is that we didn't use first fill bourbon for a reason. And the reason was that what we wanted to show was our spirit. 
we're really proud of our spirit. Even our wash is drinkable, um, which you can't say from most distilleries, but it's a fairly drinkable wash. So you wouldn't throw away a half pint of it. Um, but it's Glengoyne and Balboa are probably the two washes that I've tasted that I don't actually mind. We don't have that kind of too funky a smell. But we're very proud of our wash, very proud of our spirit. And we wanted to show that off for as long as possible. So we put that into low impact casks to then allow when we put the first filler also, you can see the new make spirit for me up to about the 18 year old. 25 year old, I think it's just the, the wood absolutely dominates it, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. It becomes this absolutely delicious whiskey, which you guys will obviously get on to see in a minute. But we wanted to show our spirit for as long as possible. That's something we're very proud of. We didn't want to just dominate it immediately. And we've got single casks in markets that are first fill Oloroso sherry for 15 years. You don't see the new make spirit in them. They create delicious whiskies, but the spirit isn't as visible. But with the core range, that's what we wanted to show. Um, hey, um, Stuart, so, sorry to check. Um, Rob was just asking, how common is it for caramel colouring to be used? In the whiskey industry as a whole, uh, very common. You, the majority of non-age statements, the majority of entry-level malts, anything that really sits at 40% to 43% will more than likely be caramel colored unless it specifically states in the box the great thing with scotch is that because we're governed by the swa we're very transparent with our our laws and regulations you know in some countries across the world they they, they create these wordings and laws within the country itself before we come into it that creates this ambiguity around scotch or irish or whatever it may be um, but because we're so heavily governed by the swa there's only certain things that we can legally do to put, say, single malt Scotch whiskey or blended Scotch whiskey, blended malt Scotch whiskey, to have that designation. Um, if it falls out of any of those parameters, we have to call it spirit drink, which I think is the most, the broadest stroke that's ever existed in spirits. Um, but spirit drink does exist in some um, unknown whiskies. And it's not that they're breaking the law, it's just that they've not met the standards of SWA. So say it's fall below 40%. Um, but caramel colouring is very common, but to kind of demystify it, IWSR have proven, so IWSR is the, um, the International Whiskey Scot Scotch Whiskey Research Institute, SWRI, apologies, SWR, Scotch Whiskey Research Institute. They have proven that the rates that caramel colouring E150A goes into Scotch whiskey, it does not affect flavour or taste, uh, sorry, nose or palate at all. It will affect colour to a minimal amount, but the rate that is put in doesn't affect palate or nose. Um, but when we go to other countries where they're having excessive amounts of it, that's where it starts to affect it. But realistically, Scotch whiskey, when it comes to caramel colouring, it's such a minimal amount. It's really just to bring from, if you've got a recipe, you're always going to obtain the, roughly the same colour, right? You're using the exact same concept casks every single time to create that, 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 that exact recipe, right? So you're not having to adjust it massively. It's not as if you're all of a sudden dumping massive amounts of sherry casks that you're going to have to bring everything else up to. You're trying to meet it as close as possible. So it's it's not it's not um, it's not a heavy amount that's used, but it is very common in your entry level malts and the majority of blended scotches as well. Even up to some fifteen year old blended scotches, you'll you'll still see it. But as I said, the packaging will tell you if it does contain or not uh, in it, which is good. Uh, what's the new Boilermaker, the wash and the whiskey? Adam, am I, am I missing something there? Well, you, you were just saying that the wash is very, very drinkable and you wouldn't throw out half the pint. So that's the, <laughs> new, right, okay, got you, that's got the you. new drink, sir. Drink the wash and the whiskey. The wash I'd and the whiskey, it yeah. I'd a try half it. Half. <laughs> a half and half with wash and whiskey. Actually, that sounds pretty good. I mean, it sounds good. It doesn't, it's not going to necessarily taste oh, good. <laughs> I wonder if I could push that past brand to get that as an activation. That'd be great. I don't want to do the Boilermaker wash and whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all OB Jura colored. So like, I, I always don't necessarily comment on other brands, um, but you know, there, there are brands that we all know that, that do color the whiskey. But again, the one thing I'll say to defend them as a Scotch whiskey advocate globally is that it, the rate that it's in their whiskies, it's not affecting their nose or flavor. It's not as proof that you can look up the documents from, from IWSR. It's true for Scotch whiskey. I'm not going to speak to any other uh, designation of whiskey globally um, because honestly, I just don't know. Um, but Scotch, it's been proven. So it happens, but I'm, I'm not, I won't, I don't think it's fair to speak, especially on a recording to, to other brands at all. Um, how did we like the 12 year olds? 
yeah, happy with it. As an entry level, and it really shifts when we get to 15, 18, 25, but it does really, really shift in space. But I think there's that classical bourbon flavor profile, but in the back, and those stewed pears that someone pulled out earlier, I think is testament to that, that you're still seeing that, those esters, that spirit really come through in it. I'm really um, thinking that the people who earlier on said about the pear on the nose and stewed apples and that sort of thing are right there and I'm looking forward to coming back to it as you indicated earlier, just to see how it compares a bit. So that was a good tip. Yeah, and it's amazing how, how often I, I say this and taste things to people who are just kind of getting into whiskey and then they go back to the first one and go, this smells completely different. This smells like you know vanilla cream as opposed to the more sharp or citrus or pears that we got at the beginning. So it does change. And so do, if anyone's necked it, I'm, I, I warned you. <laughs> uh, so moving into a little bit of our heritage and to talk to the distillery a little bit, another reason to keep your 12 in, you can sip your whiskey while listening to this nonsense. This handsome man with not a toupee, but a comb forward, I think it is. This is John Ross, who was responsible for founding us in 1790. And the Ross name is actually not uncommon. We've still got seven or eight Rosses. Uh, 1895 is where the distillery moved. So just a short stint from the farm to just next to the train line, um, which was obviously very important for resources. So just this photo here, go back a little bit. This is actually the distillery manager's house. So John McDonald, uh, still retains this house, our current distillery manager, and of course you get the distillery in the background. And if anyone's been there, you'll actually recognise that not much has, you know, from that view hasn't changed. Nothing's been built up around it. Just a few small houses. Edgerton's got a population of, I think it's 140 people, and um, it's not that big, and X amount of sheep, uh, to be honest. And then the next one here, one of my favourite stories. You'll see the date on this cask, 1949. The gentleman second from the left with the glasses on, that's called a guy called Robert Cummings or Bertie, he liked to be known as. He bought the distillery post-World War II. Uh, we only ever had three shutdowns, forced shutdowns in Bal Blair, uh, World War I, uh, the Great Depression and World War II. Bertie Cummings bought us in 1948, uh, post-World War II, got us up and running within six months to fill this, which was our first cask being filled in 1949. So doing that at a point where you still had rationing of not just, you know, raw materials, but like metals, for example. But he also bought Old Pulteney Distillery. And under his stewardship was the last time that both Pulteney and Bob Blair were under the same ownership until now. An international beverage have got both of them, which is quite nice. But he bought out Old Pulteney in the north coast. So right up at John O'Groats near uh, just next to the ferry at, uh, for Orkney. He bought it out and ripped out Pulteney because geographically it was in a worse location to rebuild Bal Blair. And uh, he bought the distillery for 40,000 GBP, 40,000 pounds. Um, solid investment. If anyone wants to look up the valuation of it now, uh, he'd be a very rich man if he was still going. Um, and the team has obviously changed, but the site has not. So you'll see the brickwork from there and has stayed the same for a long time. The size and shape we've only introduced. There you go. So this is the only change that's been made to the site which is you can see the white buildings at the back or the front of the distillery. Uh, that's our dunnage warehousing being increased our capacity. The building has quite literally not changed as you'll see it in the next videos. And actually, just to speak to the geek in me, if I go back a second and show you this photo. Bal Blair, when it was designed um, or repurposed back in the 1890s, it was one of the most efficient distilleries um, that you can see. I don't know if you guys can see my cursor, but I'll, I'll talk it through anyway. The back two buildings here, oh, thanks, Leo. The back two buildings here, this was the floor maltings, which is now um, our visitor center. And um, obviously everyone's doing industrial maltings. Some people do a small proportion of the maltings in-house, which is really cool, but it's obviously not feeding their full production site. Uh, but these were our floor maltings. And then of course, once you're malting, you need to stop germination. So you'd pass it to the next building, obviously our pagoda, which is still there, original one. This is where we would dry out the malt. And then you would obviously mill it and you would mash it, wash backs uh, into the stills, and then you would roll it right out the front door. You can see all the casks sitting at the front. Roll out the front door. Uh, we keep our casks here. These are actually cars, sorry. The casks at the front here, and you would roll it into Dunnage Warehousing. So in terms of how the distillery was built, it was a linear process. It was malt in through the back, and then it would just run straight out through the distillery, fill casks, and then out the front door. Um, if anyone's ever been up to Old Pulteney, they didn't do that. It is the most, we would say in Scotland, higgledy-piggledy. 
um, if I could turn that expression, it is built into the landscape and it's very tight and, you know, notched and circular almost in fashion. Uh, but Balboa was a very efficiently designed distillery. Um, the fashion has still not changed in Northern Ireland. Um, and then obviously up to modern day, the stonework, everything is the exact same. So speak to this picture here, John McDonald in the middle, as I said, he looks like a well-groomed horse now with his long flowing hair. Uh, this is him a few years ago, Norman at the back as our assistant distillery manager. We currently have seven Rosses still working at the distillery in Rossshire in Northern Ireland, where we're based. Uh, you've got Julie Ross here, blonde. She's married to John Ross. Then you've got John G. Ross. The rest of the team here have moved on, but we've also got Duncan Ross Taylor. We've also got uh, Jack Ross and... Oh, what's his name? He started not long ago. That's terrible. But nepotism is still very strong in the Highlands. If you've got the name Ross in your name, you're guaranteed an interview as far as John's concerned. But that brings us up to effectively modern day, um, but nothing has changed. The size and shape of the distillery has not changed. Of course, we've you, you have to change stills in terms of replace parts of them because copper is sacrificial, but the shape of the stills hasn't changed since uh, the 1890s. So it's been the exact same in shape since, since then. Speak to our process a little bit. Um, we use the Altdeer Burn. This has been our water source ever since 1790. It's actually about three or four tributaries that come together to form the Altdeer Burn. It is fresh, clean water. And the great thing is when we put this back out into once we've processed and ran it, we're obviously governed by um, National Trust. Um, not the National Trust. I uh, can't remember the name of it. The EP, Scottish Environmental Protection Agency, SEPA. Um, when we put it back out, there's actually a family of otters that live downstream from our outwater, uh, which is always quite nice to talk about. Um, how many years do you get out of a still before replacement? It's a good question. It depends on the, the, sh the point of the still. So if you've got, if you're boiling in the pot and the vapor's going up, your swan neck, which is the nice curve, that takes your biggest impact. So that takes the most heat and most pressure onto it. So your swan neck needs to get replaced fairly regularly. So just depending on fat, like Spayburn, for example, we run our stills quite quickly or very, very, very efficiently. And um, let's see, so we'll probably get maybe no five years out of a swan neck uh, before it needs replacing but your pot that'll last you a long long time and of course if you're looking at the wash still versus the spirit still your spirit still is obviously treating dealing with much more volatile liquids as opposed to your wash still and um, so yeah just depends what part of the still you're looking at as well as what still you're looking at and um, our condenser our water shell and tube condenser at Spayburn and um, we run that we run that distillery like clockwork. That is, is one of the most sustainable and energy efficient distilleries in Scotland. If anyone gets a chance, we've just opened our doors as of August 1st uh, to the public. If you get a chance to go up there, but our shell and tube condenser lasts us, what is it, two years uh, at the rate we run it. And um, so we had it replaced not long ago, which was precarious to watch when I was up there seeing it, which was cool. But they're dragging this giant shell and tube and trying to drop it in through the roof and attach it in. Uh, but for size, managed to install that in eight hours, which I think still, still blows my mind that they managed to do that so quickly. Uh, barley. This is obviously crucial for us. Uh, Concerto and Laureate has changed. I actually don't know. The agency that originally designed this kept this in. It wasn't for my approval, but I don't know why we put in the species of barley because that changes all the time, right? So we're on sassy now in terms of species of barley, if anyone's wanting to get super geeky, which I love. Um, we're on Sassy, the brand, uh, which I also think is quite a cute name. Uh, that's what we're using in terms of species. It's, it's giving John the yield he wants. Um, but we're very blessed with the size of the distillery. We're able to use not just Scottish barley, but quite literally local barley. So we're sourcing within 40 miles of the distillery for our barley uh, that is processed in Inverness, as I said, 45 minutes south in Bairds. And then we get it up to the distillery. It, it, there, I mean, there's arguments to be made for using other barley from overseas but realistically it's it's the sugar content you're looking for you know you can adjust the species that you're using and, and everything that how you process it but realistically it's it's there's nothing wrong with using international uh, whiskey like danish whiskey is quite a popular one and obviously with sadly with the war in ukraine and russia prices have gone up we've gone overnight we went from 350 pounds for a ton of malt to over 800 pounds in a 24-hour period 
And to put that in perspective, that's the first time in history that it's gone above 500, 600, 700 or 800 pounds in a 24 hour period. So John, Malcolm at uh, Pulteney were paying from 350 pounds to over 800 pounds for a ton of malt. Uh, you know, add on the energy crisis, guys, enjoy your whiskey while you can. <laughs> I am joking, obviously, but it's it's crazy how much the price of that's gone up uh, since since the war. Um, we use a Porteous mill. I, that's how I said, Rob. Just as long as it's Balboyer, please stock up. <laughs> uh, we're still using a Porteous mill. Uh, our Porteous mill's from 1964. Um, and I think you've probably all heard the story. Porteous made their mills so good that they, they went out of business. This thing still runs like clockwork. And if anyone knows about, anyone know about Ronnie Lee? The mythical Ronnie Lee, he fixes every mill in Scotland. Uh, he's been flown over to Japan before to, to look at their, their mills as well. He's about four foot nothing. He was a commerce, a Commonwealth weightlifter for Great Britain, a uh, Welsh guy. But what I love is if you go up, you'll see two plaques on mills. His old one, which is just Ronnie Lee and his details. But he's got this new plaque and he's got a Welsh dragon uh, on the plaque. So in every single mill in Scotland, there's a Welsh dragon just sitting there. And I think he loves the fact that they're red as well. So he's he's a, he's an absolute character, but he's become this kind of mythical creature that if you've not met him, you wouldn't believe it exists. But I just love that English mills fixed by a Welshman based in Scotland. Uh, you just need an Irishman and we've got a real cracking joke on the way. <laughs> um, 25 kg. Um, for anyone who knows the split that we usually look for, we look for usually a 30-70-10 split. Uh, sorry, a 20-70-10 split, but Again, this depends on the malt that we're using, but when we were using Concerto Laurier, it was 24, 66, 10. Uh, and that's why what I mean by that is when we grind the barley up, you're looking for the, the husk, the, the outside of the barley to be about the, the 20. Um, the meal, which is the kind of powder, um, you know, it's mixed in with a little bit of the, the roughness as well. That's to be the 70. That's the stuff that we take and that goes into the mash tun to be mixed with hot water. And the 10 is the flour. We don't want too much of that because it will end up uh, clogging up and just becoming really sticky, uh, like dough almost. Um, let's have a look here. Ah, see, I'm, I'm wondering when the whiskey's going to pop up at some point. It's coming because <laughs> I left it <laughs> random. Um, mashing isn't the most attractive part to to uh, distillation, but it's one of the most important. And to Bal Blair, it is arguably the most important. Um, we have capacity, and I'll talk about the stills in a minute, but we have capacity for about 1.7 million litres of alcohol per year. Capacity. But we only produce about 1.45 million litres of alcohol per year. And the reason being is that we run it low and slow. Um, it sounds like a cliche, you know, quality over quantity, and I don't think that's, that's always the case. Because that, I'm Sorry, that's the wrong way to say it, because every distillery looks for quality. Um, you know, that's not the point. What we're really wanting to say is we're, we've got a flavor profile that we're achieving. So it's the, the flavor profile over quantity. Um, because we run our smash on very, very slow. We drain it very, very slowly, meaning that we drain off the sugary liquid, the wort, one of the worst words in, in human history. Uh, but we drain off the wort very slowly and it makes it sure it's clear. And arguably, the clearer your warts, the more tropical esterification that you get. Now, if you drain your wort fast and it becomes cloudy, that's not bad. It just means it's going to give you more of a nutty flavor. It's not better or worse, it's just different. But the flavor profile that we've achieved at Balblair is because we drain our mash tun incredibly slowly to get that clear wort. Because when we add that to the washbacks, that's where we start seeing that tropical fruit really take hold. The yeast will start digesting the sugars and that gives you a very kind of, it's almost like a kind of Hefeweizen sour beer if that makes sense it's almost that kind of wheat beer that we typically associate with wash but it has this kind of a sour beer profile and behind it it's, it's really really lovely you can't obviously drink too much of it and that's not a challenge that is just a fact you can't drink too much of it but it's uh it's a good one oh i thought the 15 was coming i really thought it was coming there uh you gotta listen to me a little bit longer douglas fir uh washbacks so we have six washbacks that run at 60 actually about 64 65 hours realistic we're running uh, and then at 19.3 uh thousand liters um every single one um oregon pine and douglas fir are the exact same for anyone that's interested um i only found this out a few years ago because obviously people specifically refer to one or the other it's the exact same uh, so we use oregon pine or douglas fir take your pick 
um, but wooden washbacks. There's the whole argument, obviously, whether stainless steel or Douglas fir does it affect the flavour profile. If you ask John McDonald, he will tell you 100%. Uh, can't drink too much or can't drink very much. Again, Leo, you know what? Go for it. If you go up and ask John, <laughs> I'll come and challenge you. <laughs> we'll set a couple of schooners and absolutely run it. Uh, <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's in my opinion, I think it does. You have, you know, we, we steam our Douglas fir every single time to sterilize it. However, you're still going to see like microorganisms that will will still manage to keep creep their way in. Is it going to affect it massively? No. And I don't think to us mere mortals that we're going to see it, but I think to a master blender, a master distiller who have been designed to teach their nose, I think they would probably see it. But to us mere mortals, I don't think we would we would really notice. But I I prefer wooden washbacks. I think they're they're more romantic, they're better to look at, they're cooler. Um, but as you can see, we've only got the six, so it's just that section that you see there. Right. Come on. Yes. <laughs> and you, and you <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Because I just threw them up randomly in the slides. I was like, surely it's going to pop up soon. We're just going to have a quick fire in shit. 15, 18. Um, again, have a nose, have a taste. It's all your whiskey now. I'll just talk to it a little bit and around it. Um, you just go for it. Nose, I'll slange and cheers you now. Slange. The great thing with this, and the one thing, the reason I want to, I like to do it in this order, and you'll see what I mean when we probably could have maybe switched the 18 to 15 when we get to it in terms of flavor profile. But the reason I like to do this, if you hold up your 12 year old and your 15 and look at them together, it's natural color, so we can actually talk about this. Um, the 12 years is the foundation of the 15. So effectively, what we're doing is we're taking the same concept casks and we're just re racking them for three years in first fill Oloroso sherry. That is the only difference between these two whiskies. Obviously, it's the same spirit, same concept, original casks, 46, non-chill, no caramel colouring. Because there's no caramel colouring, hallelujah, is that we can actually look at these and see the effect of three years in first fill Oloroso, or minimal three, minimum three years, um, but it is actually around that, um, has, the, has on the liquid. You can see the colour of it. You can see the change on it. Difference. Yeah. What, and on out of interest, what do you think of the... Comparatively, the nose between the two two of them. The uh, twelve for me was a lot fresher, brighter, if you will. Um, yeah. There's much more of that raisiny, dried fruit, cherry, you know, sort of thing that's coming through on the fifteenth for sure. Yeah, I yeah. Uh, I that's back there also, and uh, there's similarities there as well. What what do you guys think? Let us know in the chat if you're getting anything particular. Honey malt, says Leo. Like, yeah, I like honey malt because it sits in that slightly darker but sugary space. You know, it's not dark, dark, but it's, it sits in there. Honey stone fruits. Yeah. yeah. That's actually a good call. Fruit. My, my apricot's one that really always pops up, and I'm always kind of happy to see, like, stone fruits that you've said, Cam, as well. It's, like, it, it's nice to see that because I, a lot of people immediately smell this and go, that's really nutty and spicy. But there is that, for me, that apricot and stone fruits comes from the spirit, not just the cask. And it's nice to see because, first of all, Oloroso is a dominant cask, right? You know, if you we've, we've thrown this in before to, first of all, Oloroso exclusively, and it, it, it dominates it. But, you know, the the, the ex-bourbon, the, the hoggies and the barrels, it's like taking it to the gym before it goes straight into a weightlifting competition with the first of all, Oloroso. It just it gets it ready and prepared for that first of all, Oloroso so we can still see that the stone fruits, the not maybe specifically mango, pineapple, brown, bananas, but we're seeing that that that, that come through in it. And um, but the 15's my I mean obviously the 25 sitting there, which is like, it's not just about the age and price, right? But the 25 stunning, but 15 is probably my favorite. Um but yeah, apricot in there, chocolate, spices, nuts. And when I say spices, it's probably closer to like a baking spices for me um, and then you can see the cast types that we've originated there so 12 years we fill bourbon three years and exclusively first fill oloroso yeah yeah absolutely um i should have shot thought of that actually i could have had some nuts and fruit for my brunch <laughs> another one uh, but it's yeah, as, as we're kind of going through that and, and keep throwing in tasting notes in the chat, um, but I'll talk to our sherry cast a little bit because I had the pleasure of uh, shadowing Miguel Martin, who's in Jerez, 
he's our sherry cask supplier. And um, so Jose Miguel, sadly, his brother passed away a few years ago. Um, but Miguel's nephews, his brother's sons, obviously, um, they're going to take over the business. Miguel's got no kids, so his, his nephews are going to take over the business. So the, they would be fourth, fourth generation. Miguel and Jose were a third. The wonderful thing, I used to speak about sherry casks very confidently. Um, and, and everything I was saying was, was ultimately correct, but it, I didn't really understand the depth of it. Which was which was really interesting. I mean, Miguel, what he doesn't know about sherry casks or sherry or production or anything, it's just not worth knowing. And um, so I went to we went and shadowed him for a while, and it's amazing. So he gives us almost too much data in each cask. He also supplies the likes of Macallan, uh, Pernod Ricard as well, um, but he doesn't exclusively go for one company because uh, these guys obviously have the buying power. He wants to make sure that he has he has enough stock to give to multiple sources. So Stuart Harvey, who's our master blender, he's harbored that relationship. So we've been working with Miguel for 18 years, 19 years uh, coming up to. And we know who picked the grapes. We know who chopped down the tree. We know who put the casks together and we know who put the, them on the drying racks. We know who put the staves and who built the rungs. Uh, the guy's a bit of a a mad scientist as well. He developed this machine where it's like a, a circle in the ground that comes up on a pole automatically so that the guys building the cask can lay the staves against the circle and then get the rung around it. So he's made their job easier. And he said, oh, I just you know thought of this and I've sent it to Spaceside Coopers to see if they want to use it. I've not patented it. it, it the guy's incredible and he's very hands-on with his, with his team and everything through it. And he creates, he creates sherry that's specifically only sold in Jerez for the other sherry production that obviously he has to do um third parties will come to him to want to create sherry that he will make for them as a process because he's got all of the ability but what was fascinating was is that a lot of people think that and i used to think as well a long time ago was that the more sherry the longer you leave the sherry in the better the whiskey is going to be and miguel kind of stomped those rumors out immediately and said no the the sherry is arguably the second important part the most important part is your oak if you've got bad oak or bad wood, it doesn't matter. You could be the best quality sherry in the world. It does not matter. Your oak is the most important part. And, you know, furthermore, onto that is that it, what was interesting is that there's actually an optimum point. It's like a bell curve of when you should be taking the sherry out. If you leave the sherry, and this is also due to which new make spirit, is it from Old Pulteney or Spaburn or Macallan or wherever? And also their spirit size and viscosity is going to affect that bell curve and where it shifts. Again, super geeky, but very, very fascinating. So for us at Balboir, um, he was saying about 18 months for your spirit to see the oak, because you need to see the woods and to see sherry. He said 18 months, I think, is optimum. And, you know, we work with Stuart Harvey very closely, and we find that's the optimum point. Beyond that, he says, you start seeing too much of the sherry and not enough of the oak. And, and that's for you guys, especially you're re-racking for three, four, five years. He said that's probably optimum. And that was fascinating to me because I think everyone thinks that the longer we leave Oloroso in or Pedro Jimenez in, the better. But there is actually a, a tipping point to leaving it in for too long. Uh, yeah. Do we have a preference out of interest to the 12 or the 15? Feel free to throw it in the chat. <clears throat> Anton, what about you? Yeah, 15 for me. Um, not, not that I had a problem with the 12, but... Um... No, I, I find that delicious. A few 15s coming through in there. Yeah. There's usually a rogue 12 somewhere, but <laughs> can't see it coming. So um, with that 12 that uh, we were to reserve, should we wait to what we've done the 18 and then go back to it or go back uh, now you think? I honestly think it's one of those ones that I think go back to uh, even after the 25 or, or keep going back to it. It's just, it's amazing how it shifts. I mean, even now we're starting to see it it's funny i do tastings with it at first i really enjoy it even after the 15 i find it gets slightly astringent on the nose and then i go back to after the 1825 and that's where it becomes like vanilla cream and um, it's almost okay. like it's going through uh, the change now or or I, my palate's been affected by it but i don't know it's <laughs> there it is i knew it'd be you lot <laughs> <Malt Maniacs. laughs> that's great <laughs> it's all with a rogue 12 uh but I Again, I there's agree, no... though, with Matt, um, sorry, with uh, whoever no, no, no. the Malt Maniacs, um, it does the 12 is punchier, that's a good word, has more cut, yeah. And and even the, the, the alcohol on it, in, 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 the, in, the good, in the good way of the, the sense of this, is like the, the alcohol in 12 feels punchier as well. And um, but it's obviously the same ABV, but it's 
it's really interesting how, and I think we've all experienced that with different whiskies, is that you'll smell two and you know that they're both the same ABV, but one really kind of kicks the hell out of your nose. And the other one's like, this is really soft and palatable and I can sip this, no problem. The other one, you're like, this one, this one needs a bit of water. Um, fascinating those little bits. I always find, you know, when you add water to whiskey, it'll change whether you enjoy that or not, it's down to you. But there's one from Drammore uh, that I tasted. Um, Kenny McDonald, I don't know if anyone's ever been at one of his tastings. Brilliant, brilliant guy. But one of his whiskies, I really enjoyed the nose with water, but the taste without. So <laughs> sitting with two drams during the taste and it spilled in, nose in one, drink in the other. Um, but it always shifts it, always shifts it. Um, right. I thought that might have been the 18, actually. I was panicking. I'd thrown it up roughly the same speed. <laughs> rapid um, fire. A rapid fire. <laughs> Just sculling it. Uh, back and fix. Double part. The still room is very rustic. I'll probably play this through again just so you can get a, a good look at them. Um, it's fairly small stills. Like, you know, well, maybe not small, but average size stills. But the 11.7 the on our spirit still is probably on the smaller size. Um, onion-shaped stills. And we're running off... Um, uh, shell and tube condensers and um, for anyone that doesn't shell and tube is exactly what it says it's a, effectively a water jacket around pipes in the middle where the, the, the gas turns into liquid again and um, worm tubs are the other one where it's uh again what it says in the tin it's a tub of water uh, the, the whiskey obviously doesn't touch it or see it it's just a condensing water and the vapor turns it into liquid inside the tubes and um, there's about 20 me and gordon bruce are talking about this i think there's about 20 distilleries now that have worm tubs out of the 140 including boutique distilleries now that exist in scotland um i think it's probably impossible i think it's went when it went from 130s a few years ago but you know you've got still just popping up all over even small ones and um, there's about 20 worm tubs and out of the five distilleries that we have four of them use worm tubs so as a ratio it's massive you know we've got nearly 25 percent of the worm tubs in scotland in our portfolio and um, but bow blair exclusively uses washbacks uh, sorry chill and tubes and we just installed two weeks ago uh, we installed a tvr system so it's a thermal vapor recompression do not ask me specifically how it works because you will not get a right answer you can feel free to google that but effectively it makes it more energy efficient it's about heat reclamation within the system so that we're not losing waste heat we're actually bringing it back in to utilize it again within the system again rob do not ask me <laughs> one second let me google this and i'll just write, write it out for a bit um it's, it's a fascinating system we had it on spayburn first uh, we're now installing it at all of our sites um but it's, it's a fantastic system but it be, effectively makes us more energy efficient it's heat reclamation and we get to use that waste heat back in the in the process it saves us a huge amount of money but as as i said it saves us a massive or saves the the circuit a massive amount of energy um, still running off the same two size and shape of stills, and um, that hasn't changed. So 19.3 for our wash and 11.7 for our spirit, because obviously we're going from a larger volume to a smaller volume when we're distilling. Um, and then, as I said, we bring off, so 68.5 to 69 is, is where we sit um, in terms of ABV coming off of our spirit. Um, outside of that is a bad day for the guys. That's where they like, that's where the point they want to cut it. Um, it's a manual cut as well. It's not automated, so it's uh, it's an interesting one to see. Most of the losers are, are automated, and to be honest, if you've got the skill level and you know what you're doing, you don't really need an automated cut. But obviously, it does make it cleaner and more efficient. You don't need somebody going to move that every single time. Um, so no, same shy safe stills, and as I said, 1.45 milliliters of alcohol per year. And to put that into perspective, your big players are producing now 24 milliliters of alcohol per year. Nothing wrong with it. As long as it's consistent, it doesn't matter. As long as it's consistent spirit, it doesn't matter how big or how small you are. Um, it just puts uh, a size and shape of us into perspective. So maturation, we have eight dunnage, but right now we have about 24,000 casks and we are pretty much at capacity uh, for our warehousing. There's no racked warehousing on site. It is all traditional dunnage warehousing. So a couple of questions in there. Sorry, guys, missed those. How are they made their heavy vapors? Um, sorry, Rob, could you clarify a bit the something with how are big made their heavy vapors? Is it just the density of the liquid you're talking about, or is it the peat? 
not sure. Um, to kind of answer how I think it is, um, yeah, so it's, it's interesting. I always think that if we're talking about the condensation side of things, washbacks, sorry, I keep saying washbacks, Shell and tube has less copper contact, sorry, more copper contact than worm tubs, but I always think that seems back to front because make sure, oh, it's a limited release. Oh, heavy vapors as in a limit. I don't think I've seen that one, if that's what it's called. Um, but heavy vapors in Ardbeg, they could be just cutting deeper into the cuts. So you've got your heads, your hearts, and your tails. In your tails, where it's your um, lower ABV points, that's where your phenols and peat content exists. So if you're cutting deeper, um, because it's a lower ABV, you've actually got more heavier compounds in that section as well. So again, this is pure speculation, but they could be cutting deeper into their tails to capture heavier compounds and also actually more peat profiles as well. Um, so maybe pure speculation. Um, how does flavor sit in the water or the alcohol after distillation? Uh, Howard, just again, to, it's a good, interesting question. I think that's more of a Stuart Harvey question, to be honest. That's maybe beyond my chemistry um, knowledge. If I could just jump in for a sec, Stuart, just to clarify what on the um, Ardbeg thing. Yeah. Um, so the heavy vapors release, uh, which was their committee release uh, this year, I couldn't remember the part of it that was taken out. They took out their purifier. Um, so essentially, oh, right. they could rise up the still and condense and caught in the purifier where the heavier compounds fall back to the still. Uh, this happens over and over again, resulting in the well-known uh, spirit that they have. Uh, the purifier was removed in this process, uh, resulting in all of that getting through. Perfect. I'm going to see if I can see our Bay, um, Val Blair's purifier on the still because it sits just before the line arm. You can just see... Oh, I missed it. So I know what purifier is, but I don't know taking off exactly what it does. So I just to point, point one out as opposed to actually talk to what it does, but you can see just here, uh, we've got stainless steel one that sits at the back. And um, so that's one there, but I honestly, it'd be, it'd be fascinating to dig deeper into that. If, uh, if I see bills actually see taking one of those off or not running it through it for that matter. I don't know. Yeah, I think actually. essentially the, like, like I said, the, he the heavier, compounds generally get blocked and recirculate back in and bounce around as the more pure or lighter um, things get through. And without that, That's it just makes everything. That should, see, if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room, right? This is great. <laughs> That's brilliant. Um, now you give given me something. I think something. a very basic understanding of it, and there's probably so many finer points to it. But that's the, that's the broad brushstroke, I think. No, that's, that's really interesting. And it's, you've given me something to, to look at this morning while I'm, you know, knocking off the, the whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's fine. I'm going to have to look at that. So that's really, really interesting. Thank you. Um, it's just still one commercial whiskey still uses a 25 beer. So, uh, Leo, it's really interesting. I was in uh, I was in Mexico recently and we were looking at um, Mezcal and there's a place called Mezcaloteca and some of these guys produce 50 litres a year off of like tiny, some of them clay stills. Um, and they only produce 50 litres a year. And this this place, Mezcaloteca, will work with different small, tiny stills because these these guys can't afford to bottle or label their own product. So they're, they're a kind of subsidiary and they teach people at Mezcal. But yes, some new distillers in Scotland, like um, the Dornick, uh, the Thompson brothers recently bought a new site and have built a bigger distillery, but they were running off a like 500 litre still and they were producing their spirit. And obviously they were bottling single cast stuff, but it, it's amazing because it's going to affect that spirit so differently. And again, it's not going to be better or worse. It's down to the expertise of the people running it. And um, that's where it really comes down to, you know, when you look at uh, Loch Lee with the tiny casks they use, you know, it's very easy to like, in all intents and purposes, lack of a better term, is burn your whiskey with a tiny cask. You know, you're introducing such intense maturation so quickly, but, you know, you've got talented people there that Loch Lee's releases were stunning really dark and obviously young, but they produce really, really lovely liquid. Um, so eight dunnage, uh, but 24,000 casks were pretty much at capacity uh, now at Bell Blair. There it is, there it is. Quick, it is pretty quick fire there. So slange, cheers, usual process. It's your whiskey, you're all adults, you know what you're doing. 18 years, 
we are same concept casks for the 12 year olds, but instead of 12 years, we rack for three, we're 14 years in the same concept casks as the 12 year old. And then we're four years in, again, first fill Oloroso sherry casks. Everything in Val Blair for the core range is first fill Oloroso. This is where it's in, you, you would think that it's the same concept casks, you know, 46, non chill, no caramel colouring. Um, you would think this is going to be the same line of trajectory, but I think it delves deeper into the sherry. This is where we start getting more chocolate, deeper, richer. I know the leather is kind of indicated there, but it's much more leathery. And it's always interesting to see those two different sides of the sherry. You know, you've got that more dried, spicier, dried fruit space which I think the 15 falls into, and that's just my preference in sherry. Um, but the 18 just reaches further in and gives you that much creamier texture. You don't see as much of the spirit at all in this. And um, I think you still see retain it in a different way than the apricots that I think some of us saw. But the 18 is just layers upon layers. There's like a tiramisu thing going on there. You still get a nuttiness on it. Um, 14 years and then refill, uh, re racked sorry, into first fill all row. So only first fill. Yeah, Cam, I agree. There's a, there's a darkness to it. And in a good way, I don't mean bitterness in a bad way, but like that dark chocolate bitterness that you get when you, you crack it. And I mean, I do mean that in a good way for me. It's great. I get, I mean, it's Thursday and it's nearly 11 o'clock and I, I get to drink. Fantastic. They pay me, they pay me every month. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Anton, what's your thoughts on that? Just again, going from 12, 15, 18, what's your... Well, to be honest, I'm just sitting on the nose for a little bit, um, which I'm not sure what I'm getting, to be honest, but it's, I'm sort of juggling between to try and pick what I'm getting. There's a definite... Um, it almost goes lighter again. It's almost more like a step between the 12 and the 15. Um And I would say it's a little more, again, a little more sharp, a little more, um, uh, a little more heat on the on the palate. I get a bit yep. more of that sort of, um, like I said before, dried fruit softness, I guess, on the fifteen. What does everyone else think? Um, this would be great at natural strength, a bit more dark chocolate. Uh, Howard, we've got uh, the, the, oh, the, Rob, the great. Rob. My, my job is I get to go down to the lab quite a lot and um, where we've got all these, you know, funky, weird, everything. And uh, I have tasted this at Cash Strength and it's incredible. I think it's, it's <laughs> yeah, it's, it's pretty incredible. Um, but again, it's that whole way, putting out to the world, you know, realistically, 1% of us want this at Cask, you know, the rest have wanted it. So you're, you're handcuffed by commercials in a way, but... It was Dave Broom talked about this quite a lot in optimum alcohol level, where it's, it carries flavor without killing it with alcohol. And I think Bal Blair, I think, stands up to, I think we could push this to 48 without, you know, for most people tipping it over the edge. Because uh, we know that we can dilute down cash strength. But um, I think 48, we could push this. I think we'd break it at 50. With Old Pulteney, um, I think because it's just a bit more of a viscous spirit, I think we could push Old Pulteney to 50, 52 before breaking it, you know, as a, as a, as a standard without diluting it, but yeah, it's, it's pretty tasty. At, pretty tasty at cask. <laughs> that would be nice. <laughs> Leo, is that you just saying, go for it to me? Bit <laughs> like, of four whiskey tasting flight at Highland Distillery at 10 a.m. My wife posted a photo to Facebook and has never let me forget it. Thankfully, my partner's out of the house today, so I can get as leery as I want. <laughs> There'll be no photos taken, thankfully. Um, Cam, cherry sweetness is a good one. Our 17-year-old that's duty-free reminds me of kind of maraschino cherry juice. It, it, it really leans toward the sweeter but deeper side of it. Um, but the 18 has elements to that, where it is that richness and it is that cherry cherry space. So it's, it's one I absolutely agree with. Something's roast there. It's really open at night. <laughs> right, you know what? Turn the recording off. Let's get plastered. <laughs> let's, let's do it. I'll stay up with you guys all night. <laughs> <laughs> that's a long travel. day for you <laughs> travel alcohol doesn't count that's a good rule you know that's a good that's a good rule, rule. Good rule. <laughs> um, so jo john mcdonald and i so john's obviously our distillery manager we we argue with this john's favorite is the 18 it is and, and it was that 
you know, Anton, what you were touching to, kind of like not knowing what you're getting and then seeing this and seeing that, that's what John sees in it, where it's every time he noses and tastes this, it's a different experience, whether he's nosing it in the morning or if he's eaten or if he's happy or sad or whatever. There, the, the reason that he, I love, I do love the 18 is because there's layers to it. There's complexity to it. You can sit with this and it really does change every time. The 15 is, it, it's, I think it's unashamedly there and in front of you and it's got nutty and spices and you see thing, you see it on this kind of welcome to my brain, the, the flat surface, whereas, and that's not a bad thing to say. It's my favorite for that kind of reason. It's nut, nuttier and spicier, but the 18 is layered upon layered. You know, there's just whether you add a bit of water to it, which I've just done actually to, to change it. But you just have a different experience every time you have the 18. It still sits within that same space, but specifically will just alter itself. That's it's just such a cracker. Um, out of interest, what's been the favorite 12, 15 or 18 malt maniacs? I'm looking to you because I always feel that some people, the rogue 12s may shift to uh, May may sometimes shift to an eighteen. Oh, you've got him out of his seat to respond and everything. <laughs> <laughs> I need to be heard. <laughs> I'm interested because some people do shift. Uh, let's see, definitely rogue eighteen. <laughs> uh, you're, you're not a rogue. I'm on the eighteen as well, for what it's worth. Sinclair's still the fifteen. Love a sherry cat, and it's that side to sherry. I think the fifteen and eighteen are two, they're just the two faces to it. So a few people shift to eighteen. It's, and I get it, you know, most people love the 18, and I, and I understand it, I love it, I think it's just, I, I like that, you know, like Glendronic 15 is one of my favourites, it's uh, it's just that intense flavour profile, and it's just different people, you know, it's again, I'm not right, I'm not wrong, it's just my opinion, and uh, that's the beautiful thing, the only person that can tell you how good a whiskey is, is you, no one else, um, and that's the, when I do tastings as well, as much to the marketing and sales as me, is that I'm here to talk about the whiskies and the production, but ultimately, you know, I hope you guys love them, but if you don't, that's fine too. You know, we're here to explore and broaden our palates and understand it. That's why Cam's got such a beautiful bar behind them because there's a wide selection of whiskeys, right? It's not just one one bottle that feeds all of us. Thanks, Rob. Can we kick him out? <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Rob said everyone is entitled to their own wrong opinion. Thank I, you. I'm that is, to that is very true as well. Uh, Leo knows of the 18 and palate of the 15. Fair fair so you'll be the same as me it's just that in the same <laughs> one glass and the other and one glass for drinking um so to talk about i've talked about them actually quite a lot to be honest but kind of to go through them again because our wood is something that we're very very proud of it's very important to us um the 18 year old i can actually probably say is majority buffalo trace we had a deal with sazerac for a very long time so the majority of ex-bourbon is probably buffalo trace now we work with with multiple different bourbon uh, distilleries but uh, Maker's Mark is a big one, Jim Beam's also a big one that we source from um, but the 18 I can almost guarantee um, but these are the three casks that we not exclusively but 98% of our stock is made up of especially our core skews uh, are made up of these three, American Standard Barrel or an ASB uh, Scottish Hogshead which is obviously just a, a repurposed barrel so the same staves you know, Hogshead is always minimum third fill really Um just a fatter barrel um, and they're strategically used. I think we can use, and the reason that we use refill is, is for a, it's a specific reason. It's not because they're low, it is because they're low impact casks, but it's not that we're trying to cheapen. The reason that we use it is because we want to see our spirit. If we use first fill bourbon, it's going to make a really tasty whiskey. And we've got an example of that, I think in the whiskey shop in the UK, a uh, single cask, it's all first fill bourbon. But what we wanted to show in the core skews is, see our spirit for as long as possible and that's why we deliberately or tactically used refill casks and then our spanish oak butts um, and all first fill across the full range including our 17 year old and duty free um which is uh, which is first fill oloroso as well um, and then our i think one of our single casks is a second fill oloroso that was uh that was just out of we we really loved it we bottled it but i think all the other single casks are either our first fill oloroso if you see sherry ones of them I realise I've actually spoken to that quite quite well, and I should have hidden this slide. But our whiskies that we've already drank three of, uh, <laughs> I think we all know what's coming next. There it is. There it is. Now, have a nose, have a taste. This is all yours, but just to speak to this a little bit, I think we're all guilty of just seeing price points and numbers. But 
ignoring that for a minute and stripping back labels and boxes and brands, ignoring all that to, to really talk about the, the reason I love whiskey is the liquid inside of it and and just, you know, what we talked about and showed in those videos. And I, I like those videos because I don't only like to do presentations, but I think it shows you the tangible aspect to it and the people in the place side that 25 years, what was everyone doing 25 years ago? No incriminating stories, please, because this is a recording, but 25 years have passed Weddings have been had, babies have been born, you know, celebrations, all, you know, miseries, all of that has passed. And then 25 years, the casks, the liquid in this bottle was sat in casks. And then 25 years later, we are all sitting, drinking it from the exact same batch. Now, starting University of St. Clair, nice. You're uh, 25 years ago, the iPhone didn't exist. It didn't exist, right? We had the... Remember the Motorola, the tiny silver flip phone? That's that's what we had. I don't even think we had that 25 years ago. The Nokia 5110. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember dial-up? Do you remember dial-up? Uh, all of these things were happening when this liquid was poured into cask. And then 25 years later, we're all sitting from that exact same batch. And I think that's quite special. And I think we, you know, we, I have to, you know, when we do festivals and taste things or, I have to remind the team of how special the liquid actually is. It's not just a price point that we're pushing or at 25 years. It's it's history and it's culture. And it's and and you know, I get the, I have the great honor of being able to travel the world and talk about that. But I really have to emphasize that yes, we get to steal a sip every 15 minutes. But <laughs> really what we're actually showing here is something pretty special. It's a liquid that imagine parking your car for 25 years. A hell of a bill. 20 years are the same concept casks as the 12 year olds. So 20 years, and then we're re-racking for five years into first fill Oloroso Sherry. 46% non-chill filtered, no caramel. And the biggest question I always get asked with the 15, 18, 25 is that if you look at the colors of them, if any, if any of you have kept the 15 or 18, the color is actually roughly the same in all of them. And this is because it's first fill Oloroso. And actually the time spent in first fill has gone from three years in the 15, to four in the 18 to five in the 25. And if you imagine a graph, if you have immediately as you introduce the, the bourbon into the first Valoroso, you have this very quick jump because it goes into first Valoroso. So all the remnants of that sherry is still in there. So you have this very quick jump, then you have a gradual increase in color. So realistically, one year apart, separating the 15, 18, 25 in sherry, you see this jump immediately and then a slow increase and that's why the color is roughly the same is because we're using first fill oloroso sherry in the process um sorry howard so the start from the 15 we are 12 years in the same concept casks in 12 then we are three years in first fill oloroso the 18 is 14 years as the same concept casks as the 12 year olds and then we are four years in first fill oloroso and then the 25 is 20 years, same concept casks as the 12, five years, first of all, or also. And I think that's why the 12 is so important because it really is the building, the foundation in which all of these are, are built on. And it's nice to see that that graduation in profile and color from the same base. You know, it's, I think that's why I, I do love Belware because there's, there's an honesty to it in the sense that you can see the, you know, it's the same cast we're using, but the, the flavor is so different. If Judy Garland was a whiskey, 25-year-old Bal Blair is, is her. Uh, there's an elegance to it. There's a velvety kind of nose. There's a brightness that we saw in maybe the 12. It's soft. got the nose of, um, like, um, what are they called? Uh, is it Jersey Caramel, Lois? It's like the the caramel and white layer. I don't know if, I don't know, if that's an Australian thing or not. But it's like a soft caramel sort of... Um, with a little bit of vanilla and it's uh that's i just got a one of those mem organolytic memories just kicked straight in from that and it's a lot obviously you'd expect a lot softer on the on the palate but yeah that sort of just um it's lovely of course i love those kind of all you know those olfactory memories where you smell something you're like that's this because it's just that uh, it, you know it informs your tasting notes so much better as well when you have them how it said the nose of the 25, the palate of the 15. I definitely cool. really like this nose. I'm with you there. But I think I still might prefer. Yeah, I'm 
you got you. I can I can't see you, Anton, but I can see you frantically in my mind. I can see you frantically nosing these going, which one which one is it? Which one do I prefer? Um, there's something about the 15 that keeps coming back. Have you gone back to the 12? Has anyone gone back to the 12? I just went through the whole like just nosed them all and um I see I do see what you mean about getting that vanilla y buttery sort of Yeah. Um it's the 25 i think is quite fascinating because much like the 18 it's got layers and some but i think we see in the 25 a lot of what we saw in the 12 and the 15 and the 18 kind of coming together yeah it's the same concept casks just a little bit longer and again it takes this takes it all with them in this other trajectory and you can see everything in it you know <laughs> burnt butter in the nose of the 12 now nice palette 18 so nose 25 palette 18 her I think, yeah, Howard, I'm with you. I think that's where I might sit. That's, that feels like it's not um, being fair to the 25 because it's lovely. This, I think um, the 18 has a little bit more of something. Yeah, it's, and again, you know, going back to that is the amount of times, you know, we've, we've all experienced it where someone says, oh, older is better and darker is better and, you know, it's or even higher ABV is better. And it's like, that's not true. It's what do you like and the really the buck stops with you it doesn't start and stop with anyone you know we can get whiskey experts saying best whiskey 2023 you know like not for me you know it's it really is down to and that's maybe more of an analytical view of liquid as opposed to enjoyment of of a liquid right um so it's not always about again sales people hate me adam probably hates me you probably hate me Anton. but it's not always about the uh, the age or the price it's which one do you like best and you know if the 12 year old's your favorite fantastic great it's not going to burn a hole in your pocket 25 year old your favorite tough that's that's the one you're going to get stuck with if you yeah, want your favorite. Sure, that also that also extends to this whole journey and um experience that we all share in whiskey is that some people will like you know bourbon barrels some people like those big heavy sherry bombs or isla peats some people would, would like to put a drop of water or two some people want ice some people mix every, mix a 30 year old whiskey with coke it's how you enjoy it you know um there, there may be a standard but if you enjoy it whichever way you want to do it that's what's for you you know Just don't let anyone tell you which one's best or how you to drink it best if uh if you find it works for you then you enjoy it and I think that's the golden rule underneath everything. 100%. I mean, my favorite profile in whiskey, the profile is peated tannins, like, you know, peated sherry, peated port, peated wine. I, I love it. I, it's just, you know, it's like a, not a guilty pleasure because I don't think it's, I, I, I don't feel guilty. Uh, it's just a really lovely profile. Um, but that's that's my favorite profile in whiskey. But it doesn't mean that I want to drink that all the time, you know. No. Uh, peated wine cask. It's like a... He does a good one. Uh, Lick Chig. I've got a uh, Rioja. Lick Chig did their Sinclair series and they did the Rioja cask. Uh, yeah, the, the, the Rioja cask. That's, that's, that's yeah. been um, pretty popular. There's a couple of couple of others I can, can't think off the top of my head, but um, I tell you, just yeah. on that that peated um, uh, sherry way, we had a we had a Kalila bottle. I can't remember. It was one of the independent bottlers, and the combination of that. And I think I want to say it was I was 17 or 18 years old, but it came out smelling like a slow cooked brisket, you know, oh. and it just had it was just it didn't taste like that. But the nose, you just could have sat there and nose this thing all day. Um, and but that was that combination of flavors and things. And it's just, yeah, that's a that's a good combination. <laughs> That's it. I mean, the the Lake Chig, the Sinclair, the Rioja, it smells like um, frazzles. I don't know if anyone's ever had frazzles. They're a bacon crisp here in the UK and it's exactly what it smells like and I just love it. Anyway, I'll bring I'll bring it back to Bal Blair, shall I? <laughs> now that we've had a good a taste <laughs> punting other whiskies here. Uh, I'll bring it back to, to Bal Blair. Now that we've tasted all four, um, I know some people have already said do it, overall, what's the favourite been out of the out of the four of them? While Thank everyone is writing in the comments, I'm gonna say especially for value right considering the price difference and the jump you get after the 18 i think the 15 and the 18 um depending on which side of that fence you sit uh yeah. pr pretty remarkable whiskey so um, personally i'd probably go the 18. 18. Yeah. 
Ai, reti. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's funny. Like, I, I love the 18 and it's, it's that way. It's not, it's just my palate. It's just my preference. And that, that's why I love the 15 because it's, it's, it's more intense, nuttier, spicier. And the 18 is it's creamier, more chocolatey. And I think it's obviously depending on your mood and what attitude you're in. Uh, yeah, rogue, rogue twelve. <laughs> it is. That rogue twelve coming right back. <laughs> now, um, oh, before I forget, because I should have said it at the start, um, while everyone's still in here, um, at the conclusion of the tasting tonight, and also on the email that'll go out, to, uh, excuse me, tomorrow with the YouTube link for those of us who didn't join, for those of you watching retrospectively, I hope you've enjoyed this uh, all the same. Um, there will be a code uh, given to get 10% off um, through the whiskey company store uh, through till the end of the weekend for 10% off the off these bottles and uh, what we've got here from Bubble Air. So I will post that both in the chat here and also on the email tomorrow. And also the last thing before we finish up for the night, um, someone, one of you guys here is going to uh, win a bottle of Bell Blair for participating tonight, but um, we won't get into that just yet, but uh, don't go anywhere is the... It's a hot tip. Don't drop out early until that's done. So um, what else are people saying down here in the um, the alcohol dominates too much in the 12 after trying the others? And trying to decide between 18 and 25, maybe 18 considering cost, but 25 has an awesome nose to it. I agree with that. Super interesting thing, the difference considering how they were made. Yeah, no, I like I completely agree. And obviously cost comes into the, the deciding factor. And it was interesting, Leo, seeing the, Alcohol, alcohol dominates that in the 12 because again it's, it's all down to individual experience because i always find that 12 softens in alcohol because it becomes more vanilla cream and um, but it's not no one's right no one's wrong it's just always i always find that really fascinating to see everyone's different opinions and, and how it how it runs uh, after being glass for 50 minutes was amazing it's just a different kind of viewpoint there can i elaborate on what i've introduced to so, yeah um so i've got uh i've actually got one of vintage here the 1989 the, the the issue that we had with vintages was that there is no consistency, right? So your the 1989 was very different to the 1990, which was different to the 95, which was different to the 2005. So there was zero consistency. So the issue that we had was that people would pick up a 1995 and go, this is delicious, I love it. And they would pick up a 1989 and be like, I don't like this at all, this, is, this isn't right. There was no consistency at all. So in 2019, we made the decision to go to a, a core range, which allows you to have that consistency of experience from the 12, the 15, the 18, the 25. So that every time that you reach for a bottle of Alblair, you're not going to have a nasty or positive surprise. It's going to be this consistency point. And, and obviously the big C word that we've all just gone through, um, the, the, the thing that we had was it's, it's sustaining that and still activating that and pushing that out. But we've not been able to have conversations really about limited editions or cash strengths or potentially doing vintages. Um, so now we're in a position to actually start having those conversations. Like, do we bring back vintages? Do we do limited editions? Do we do weird cask finishing? But the last three, four years has really been about fighting fires and making sure that we're projecting out the core skews. So it's not to say that they're gone forever. It was just that we needed a core range to ensure that we had that consistency around flavor profile. <laughs> yes, they have. Um, yeah. God, I've got, I've thankfully got a connection down in London who's, uh, I've got Spring Mountain 15 there. And he was like, these are selling out fast. Do you want one? And I was like, yes. He went, I'll give you a cost. And I was like, thank you very much. Yes. Uh, Spring Bank has had massive success, but I also think that's part of their USP, right? Like I love Spring Bank. I'm a massive fan of them. Um, but it's, it is part of their USP and it's, it's rough, raw whiskey. You know, it's like OG whiskey making, right? And they, they're, they're unapologetically that. Um, and they produce amazing liquids as much. <laughs> you know what? I'm not following this trap. We're not talking about it anymore. But <laughs> that's a very good comment. Uh, and Rob, take the purifier. I'll speak to John. Um, Cam, I'm assuming are you 1989 born? No, because that was an absolute cracker. The last time I opened this, or the, when I opened this, sorry, was uh, when Scotland beat England in the Calcutta Cup. Uh, so it was nearly finished. <laughs> Uh, just love the whiskey. Ah, brilliant. No, the, the 89 is brilliant. The, I messaged John McDonald because he's a big rugby fan and said, uh, I just cracked the 89 when Scotland beat England. And he said, I just cracked the 75. <laughs> it's like, oh, fair play. It's nice when you have access to it. 
Um, right, I think uh, I think that's us. That's it. Um, obviously, I'm I'm in no rush to go anywhere. I've got not gotten anything on till uh, two o'clock today. So if there's any questions, please fire them in. Uh, what um, I might do is before we start um, asking people if they want to come off and um, off mute and ask some questions, I might do the draw, um, uh, which would be a prevalent thing. So what we've done, I normally try to mark the back of all your tasting mats for this, but I forgot to do it for this one. And the last one, for those of you who have been with us for the last couple, I've uh, been a bit negligent on that. So what we're going to do is uh, in the participants, we've got 16 people taking out myself and Stuart. That leaves 14. So I'm just going to do a random number generator and then count down from the top. Am I not in this, Anton? No, unfortunately, you're not. The, the cost of shipping would kill it then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, um, I'm going to hold that up. Oh, hang on. Can I get it to register on the camera? I don't know if you guys can see that, but it says one to 14 and number 10. Hopefully that's clear. And so for 10, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And the lucky winner is Phyllis Levy, Dr. Phyllis Levy. So um, thank you. Um, congratulations. Um, I'll contact you on email and uh, get a bottle out to you. Um, thank you everyone for participating. And with that, I'd like to um, invite anyone who would like to come off mute um, and ask Stuart a question and uh, please take this opportunity now. Anybody? Stuart, how many, um, how many tastes do they have for the making of uh, Angel's uh, Share the Movie? How many takes or tastings? All of the above. <laughs> I know the guys drank a significant amount of whiskey when they were filming up there. Uh, um, it was good. Like John's story that he always tells is that Ken Ken Loach, obviously a very famous British director, he was told that you could in the Highlands you can kind of just walk into people's houses and chat to them. I think he was told as a joke. So John was eating his dinner, uh, and <laughs> random guy, uh, random few guys walked in, and Ken Loach being one of them, and said, "Is it going you the you the distillery manager about blue?" And he went, "Aye." <laughs> Like, can I talk to you about the facility? Like, can I finish my tea first? So Ken just walked straight into John's lounge and John was eating his dinner, which I love. But um, they, 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 they used in the movie, uh, they moved like John Ross was in it and um, John G and Duncan were all in it. So it's quite cool. I've watched it back since. And uh, it's just funny, obviously, going up there. I go up there five times a year and it's really cool to kind of see uh, you know, where they filmed it, what what warehouse they were in, you know, you can you can see those casks are still there that were were filmed at the time. So it's it's a great movie for anyone that's not seen it. Um, I highly recommend it. It's, it's a very very funny movie. Um, it's about um, three, three bands going up north to steal the, the one of the best whiskies ever bottled. You know, I'll definitely give that a look. I've I've had it uh, recommended by a couple of people. Um, Cam uh, has just said that uh, he's got no mic, but thank you so much. Um, Thank you, the most informative session he's attended so far. So there you go. Big tick for you. Thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate that. It's, I know it gets quite geeky sometimes, but I kind of, that's, that's the kind of side that I really love about whiskey. So it's trying to explain that as, as simply as possible, but it's just, yeah, that's the, that's the part I really love is the, the geeky liquid side of it. Uh, the stories are fantastic as well, but I really like that bit. Uh, and I try not to script the tastings, but the, the one the one thing I forgot to tell you about is the, the logo on the bottle is actually carved on a Pictish stone. So the stone's about 5,000 years old when it was erected. The symbol is about 2,000 years old uh, to 3,000 years old that was carved on it. So it's the symbol, but it's the, the Z-rod. Thank you, Anton. Can you see that? Oh, it's bloody. <laughs> the circles are, are, by archaeologists have estimated, it's the sun and the moon. And the Z-rod with the X is life and ultimately death at the bottom of it. But it's carved in a stone called the Clachbiore, which is the, the sharp stone, technically, but we call it the standing stone in Edgerton. And you can Google that standing stone Edgerton and see it. Um, but we noticed a few years ago that there's mud going up the side of it. Uh, and the cows in the field had been scratching themselves on this 4,000 odd year old stone. So we've had to put a fence around it um, to stop them. But it's, it's, it sits right out front of the distillery. And that's where we get our, our symbol from. I forgot to talk about that. But yeah. Just another question for the movie. Looks like uh, Charles McLean had a good time. Does it take offence if you call him Rory, Rory McAllister? <laughs> you know what? I don't think I've ever heard anyone call it. I'm sure they will. Uh, I mean, he's brilliant in that movie. I, I've only I've only had the pleasure to, in passing to meet Charlie once, um, so I don't I don't know him well. But 
obviously what a, what a whiskey icon he is. Um, but he's he's he was surprisingly, ve- but not surprisingly, it's it's just, it's just Charlie being Charlie. But like he was very good in that movie, wasn't he? That oh, was it was a good laugh. It was a good laugh. Really enjoyed it. I was I remember when it popped up and I was like, the hell they've actually cast. I wonder how much he get paid for that. Oh, my stash that glorious, you know. Thank you, Leo. Uh, thanks very much. Appreciate that. Any questions? That was, um, sorry, I was just going to say that very, that was um, to echo the couple of people in the chat. That was very informative and um, great um, uh, visuals as well with those um, infographics and the videos and things like that. I think uh, we all appreciate seeing some of that and uh, your knowledge of uh, everything that was going on was uh, very well received. <laughs> Enjoy your really <laughs> Thanks, Rob. I definitely will. <laughs> Yeah, All right, is there anyone else who'd like to like to say anything before we um wrap this one up? No? Sure. Well, um, in that case, I'm going to finish the recording. Thank you, everybody. Thank you particularly to Stuart. Um, I think we all know a lot more of them about Belle Blair than we did an hour ago. Um, and all have found our favourite bottle for the night and um, hopefully uh, some ongoing whiskies that will uh, add to our collections. So for everyone watching um, in the future, retrospectively on YouTube or whatever, we hope you've enjoyed it. Um, and moving forward, there will be more tastings coming up. So keep an eye on the newsletters and all that for what's coming next. Thank you, everybody. Have a really safe night and uh, we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Thanks all. Bye.